I'm Greg Gershuni. I'm the Executive Director of the Aspen Institute's Energy and Environment Program. So welcome to our DC headquarters. We work with people, organizations, and governments to move towards greater action on climate change. Our work includes decarbonization, like energy policy, marine shipping decarbonization, as well as working with the education sector. We have adaptation and resilience programs on wildfires, drinking water systems, and coastal flooding. And we work to build relationships that enable cooperation, including through our Future Leaders Program that develops the next generation of climate policy leaders and entrepreneurs. The climate crisis is here today. From 116 degrees in Sacramento on Tuesday to extreme floods in Kentucky and Pakistan, we're already seeing the impacts. But what we have today are solutions for the crisis. We've researched and developed new technologies that can generate zero emissions electricity. Electric vehicles are seen more and more uh, on the road every day. And our national labs and tech incubators are researching solutions for the so-called hard to decarbonize sectors like heavy duty transportation and industrial decarbonization. Today, we're talking about the U.S. path forward to taking historic action on climate change through several bills passed through Congress, as well as actions taken by the executive branch. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce the Deputy National Climate Advisor, Ali Zaidi. Ali? You'll um, hear a longer spiel from me in just a minute uh, or two, but before I dig in, um, we have some news that we're rolling out uh, today. Um, later today on a webinar, um, we will be launching uh, a new website that helps us uh, adapt and 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 deal with uh, the challenges of the climate impacts that have already been unleashed. And to to talk through that uh, and the tool we're rolling out is someone uh, who many of you know, uh, a core member of our day one uh, climate team, uh, David Hayes, who um, served in the Clinton administration, served in the Obama administration. We. Uh, we have a good rec track record of re uh, repeat customers into climate service uh, in the Biden administration. Um, and uh, David uh, has just been a pillar on our team on resilience and, and so much more. So over to, over to you, David. Citivism is a good thing. Maybe, I don't know. Um, so uh, I wanna give you a sneak preview of the uh, announcement that's gonna go public at one o'clock today. And uh, as Ali mentioned, it's an announcement that grows out of the president's commitment to help communities become more resilient uh, in the, uh, to the climate impacts that are hitting so many communities hard right now, seemingly every day. Uh, extreme heat, catastrophic wildfires, long-term droughts, epic floods. It's called the Climate Mapping and Resilience and Adaptation Portal. CMRA, camera, how about that? <laughs> or we should just call it maybe the Climate Mapping Portal. But here's a quick, super quick introduction to some of its capabilities. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, first, it will have a geospatial based dashboard, a real time right now on a re real time right now basis. It's going to show for all areas of the country, and you can zoom in to census tracts here, exactly what's being what's happening right now in terms of climate impacts, serious climate impacts, extreme heat, drought, wildfire, inland flooding, coastal flooding, and how many Americans are being hit right now by these conditions. Uh, second, it uses a state-of-the-art climate modeling and downscaling to project future climate impacts in individual communities and even neighborhoods uh, by, by mid-century and by late century based on low emission scenario and high emission scenarios. Compare, for example, two slides from the portal showing sea rise related flooding in Miami-Dade County in the late century. This is the slide showing under a low emission scenario of what's going to happen in specific tracks uh, in that area. Next slide is the high emission scenario in late century. So through the modeling, it's IPCC based modeling, uh, you can see uh, what we have to do and why we have to do it. Uh, and finally, uh, the portal will pull together in one place a huge amount of information that will help communities make smart, resilient investments for their priority climate risks, including, for example, basic information that you can't find right now, such as where are the funding streams, the federal funding streams that we, our community might be able to access to help us. Next slide. It's, it's not by, uh, it's organized by climate impact 
not by agency. So communities can find the information that they need. So check it out. At one o'clock, this portal is going to go live. We're going to have a webinar that will be posted on the White House website for all of you to see and walk through later today. So that's it. Thank you. All right. Um, we'll leave it to someone from Rochester, New York, who grew up in the shadow of the Kodak plant to name something camera. Um, yeah. But look, um, I, you know, I think that uh, um, this drives home that when we talk about code red for humanity in the IPCC context, that's not some esoteric concept globally. That's something that's hitting locally. And I think one of the most powerful aspects of the way the president has gone about tackling climate action, and I'll give a bit of an overview of this, is to identify that code red emergency, um, to identify the crisis that we're seeing in our communities that our uh, people are seeing in their lives and in their public health, but also to identify the opportunity. Um, this is a picture of the president uh, very joyful um, uh, in August of last year when he signed an executive order um, announcing that we would set our sights on 50% um, electric sales by 2030. And that vehicle, by the way, is a plug-in hybrid. Breaking news this morning is that Jeep is going to make um, a fully electric version of that and by the way, also breaking news from this morning is that Jeep is going to set its own 50% by 2030 target. And that brings me to the theory of the case. Um, the president has had, I think, three sort of guiding lights on uh, how we pursue climate action. Number one is to define this as the decisive decade. Um, to make sure that we leave nothing on the table in terms of the transformation we seek to meet the moment on climate change. And that means internationally, that means here in the United States, and that means at the local level. If you look at the construction of the Inflation Reduction Act, 10 years of certainty uh, for tax policy, 10 years of certainty for investors, 10 years of certainty for workers and communities, we're taking advantage of the decisive decade, not only as a challenge to us, but as an opportunity for our economy. So that's guiding light number one. I think the second big thing that the, the president has really focused on in terms of climate action is this notion that we can make it in America. Um, Decatur, Illinois, um, uh, just today, um, uh, we heard an announcement out of there, a factory that used to make uh, compressors for the internal combustion engine is now making compressors for electric vehicles. Um, you know, this is not the fancy big, you know, gigafactory. Uh, it's one of these industrial facilities that are found all across our country that have helped build our middle class. Um, now those facilities, those people who powered our middle class are going to help us turbocharge into a future that is clean. Um, and then the third part of all of this is to code into the DNA of the way we approach climate action, a focus on empowering workers and empowering communities. And you see that, you know, not everyone flips through the tax code. Um, I, I, I do. Uh, <laughs> this, could be, this could be an anonymous meeting. Uh, uh, probably a lot of you. And, and, you know, one of the things that's just profoundly remarkable, and I remember we were having this conversation with the president when he was on the campaign, you know, white polo shirt, porch in Wilmington, Delaware, um, talking about the tax code and how we were going to integrate domestic content requirements. I see Jason Walsh in the back. Um, you know, domestic content requirements, uh, requirements around apprenticeships, uh, requirements around prevailing wage an elevated tax credit if you build in disadvantaged communities, places that are left out and left behind. And he was, he, he, he took that in and he said, not only are we going to do this, we're going to build the coalition that helps us get across the line. And I think one of the things that has been so profoundly exciting 
Uh, and I think about the journey um, that our climate office has been on, um, that uh, we've been so fortunate to have Gina out front leading us on, is that that coalition is strong, it endured, it was durable, and it drove forward the progress on all three of those key elements of climate action. And the way we were able to do it is by, oh boy, we went too fast, is by pursuing every lever of climate action um, that we had available to us. The first is making sure that we were taking advantage of executive actions. You know, methane is a great example of this. In a methane action strategy issued last year um, that pulled together the interagency over 40 executive actions that we set out to do over the course of this term. We brought in, thanks to John Kerry, over 100 countries around the world on a global methane pet pledge. And now we've got resources in the Inflation Reduction Act and the bipartisan infrastructure law that help us make investments against that goal. So executive action, very critical element to that. And I think in the coming weeks, you're gonna see additional executive action on methane uh, to capture the flaring uh, that we see um, when we waste the gas rather than put it into a pipe and ship it to market. The second is, is legislative action. And I think it's really important to see the bipartisan infrastructure law and the Inflation Reduction Act as interlocking. Um, and you know, there are, there are uh, so many facets of um, uh, both of these pieces of legislation that I think are worth drawing attention to. The first is this ability um, not only to incidentally think about communities that are left out and left behind, but to be purposeful, deliberate, and central um, uh, about thinking through that. You know, we talked about lead pipes and, and, and lead paint at the beginning of this administration. We said we we're gonna set um, a target to try to get all of those pipes out. Uh, people were skeptical. Um, you know, Congress had invested in the millions of dollars uh, into things like lead pipes, the millions of dollars, right? Um, I used to work at the office managing budget Every million dollars was very hard. I remember um, in the middle of this December 2015, we're negotiating the Paris Agreement, we're negotiating tax extenders, trying to keep the government open. And I'm on the phone in Paris with Gina McCarthy in the middle of the night talking about millions of dollars, <laughs> right? In a trillion dollar government. And now we've got the resources in the billions of dollars as part of a broad interagency lead pipe and paint strategy to go do the work to remediate this legacy pollution. That's a really big deal. Um, you know, you look at the power sector, I I'm so excited about it, but for so long we've thought about the two thirds of the power sector that's investor owned utilities and merchant utilities. We sort of forgot about this one third of the power sector. That's municipal power, public power and rural co-ops. These are going to be the entities that help us drive this opportunity into every zip code of the country. And that's why it's so exciting that the tax code is now going to be more favorable in terms of deploying uh, for these public entities. Direct pay for rural co-ops, direct pay for public power, direct pay for nonprofits that are serving low-income communities. The power sector is going to be transformed, but not in a business as usual way. It's gonna be transformed in a way that's very consistent with those three goals that Joe Biden laid out, the North Star of this administration. You look at transportation, you know, that same day uh, in August, uh, Gina and I were, were with the new president of the UAW at the time, Ray Curry. And Ray raised with the president, you know, don't just focus on the tax credits. Focus on the loans through the ATVM program. Focus on the retooling grants, facilities like that in Decatur, Illinois. Make sure you're investing in that whole supply chain, Mr. President, because you say you want to win the whole finish line. That's not just going to be the consumer credits. That's got to be everything. And Ray had organized Freightliner in North Carolina. So he knows about heavy-duty trucks. For the first time ever, our tax code now includes electric tax credits for commercial vehicles. So those big polluting diesel 
trucks, those drage trucks in ports and in communities that have dense pollution in them, they can now shift to clean. That's a really, really big deal. So this is not, again, transportation, electrification, business as usual. This is a transformation in our ability to win the whole finish line. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to speed up here. I know. I know. Um, industry, big deal. And, and, and I think the third pillar, so executive action, legislative action, the third is catalyzed action. You know, part of the reason this is happening in Decatur, Illinois, is because J.B. Pritzker has complementary policy on retooling. He's got complementary policy on deploying rooftop solar. He's got complementary policy helping train up workers. There's a beautiful story um, from Wise County, Virginia, uh, that's in the paper this, this morning um, about an apprenticeship program that was stood up. I didn't do it. <laughs> <laughs> um, about an apprenticeship program that was stood up in the last year um, with electricians to help train up folks who would be part of the solar workforce. And there's the story about a guy who's 19 years old who went through this program and now has enough money to buy his own truck uh, and is just thrilled about his prospects in the energy economy because of the Inflation Reduction Act. So catalyzed action. That means catalyzed action at the private sector. It means catalyzed action in state and local government. Um, and it means catalyzed action around the world. So those, all of those tools are the ones we've been chasing after. And this is the this is the sort of final thing I wanna get off my chest is just, I think for us to be successful, and I think this has been um, the transformative aspect of the president's leadership, vice president's leadership, of Gina's leadership, is to bring the entire cabinet together and to bring the entire economy together, every single sector, and say, all of you have a role to play whether you're in the power sector, you got a role to play. Offshore wind, we're going to do executive actions. We're going to lease like we've never leased before. You got a role to play. If we're in the uh, if we're in the transportation sector, you got a role to play. Uh, heavy duty trucks, light duty vehicles, uh, making sure that sustainable aviation is a transformation and an innovation that happens here in the United States. You got to you got to be part of the solution. Industrial sector. Steel and cement, things people said were hard to decarbonize. Well, you know what we do in the United States? We do the things that are hard to decarbonize. And that's what we're going to do in the industrial sector. And methane, super pollutant, well, we're going to train super focus on taking that out of the atmosphere. Um, building sector has been incredibly challenging. I think with heat pumps, not only the Defense Production Act being invoked to help manufacture that, but also tax credits to help deploy it, we're going to get after the building sector. We're getting after the lands sector. I know a lot of you do work in that space. Uh, an executive order signed on Earth Day uh, to make sure we're protecting our old growth trees and a partnership for climate. Go back. Yeah. I just want to point out that I'm in that picture. <laughs> <laughs> this is the whiz Gina photo. Environmental justice, I think the Justice 40 initiative, path breaking, lots of work to do, but lots of progress under our belt. Energy communities, we're seeing the transition happen in an incredibly powerful way. And that's because we've centered around things like transforming these old assets into new ones that can be useful to the grid, capping wells and, and, and capping methane pollution. Resilience, David talked about this, but the mapping is part of a broad and, and dense set of policies aimed at helping bend the risk that our communities face. And by the way, that risk is not just felt by our communities, that's felt by the financial system first ever executive order focused on climate related financial risk. And we've got a multitude of agencies out there tackling that risk, whether it's in housing or in our pensions. So, you know, where does that bring us? We, in the, where we stand today, almost 60 million homes in the United States worth of electric power, 
one out of seven of those clean electrons deployed in the Biden administration. But are we resting on that? Are we going to autopilot on that? No, we're going to go two, three times faster now because of the policies we've secured. Two million electric vehicles on the road, but our sights are set high. We got to go fully electric and we got to get to those 50% sales by 2030. We got 3.2 million Americans working in clean energy. Everybody's going to be part of the clean energy economy because the economy is going to be clean. And we're going to lead by example, the federal government being a purchaser and a first mover in all of this. But I think ultimately there's, there's really, you know, I think the way I, I process this is it really comes down to a single North Star, um, a single North Star. And that is, are we going to meet the moment in this decisive decade when it comes to climate technology and solutions? Is it going to be made in America? And are we going to live up to the DNA that the president has coded for climate action in this administration, centering on workers and communities? Um, these are a bunch of numbers that the, that the analysts spit out on the impacts of the Inflation Reduction Act. But I think if you look at it at a conceptual level, that's what the Inflation Reduction Act's about. That's what the bipartisan infrastructure law is about. That's what the 200 executive actions we've taken to date is about. That's why we get together. It's not to talk. It's not to hang out. We love our cabinet colleagues, but it's not just to hang out with them. It's to further that North Star objective. It's one that the president forged. It's one that he got 81 million votes for, a mandate, uh, and he's driven that mandate into action. So really grateful to, to Greg and to Aspen uh, for being here, and, and I'll hand it over to our next uh, more exciting part of the program. Thank you, Ali, and thank you, David. Uh, it is now my pleasure to introduce Justin Worland, senior correspondent at Time, and Gina McCarthy, the national climate advisor to the stage. Thank you. Well, thank you, uh, Greg, uh, for uh, having this and, and inviting me. I'm glad to be here. Um, I'd like to start out really kind of almost coming off of that last slide there, uh, the by the numbers, and ask you a really high level question, thinking about the numbers in the Inflation Reduction Act. You know, all the modeling sort of suggests around a 40% uh, reduction from 2005 levels by 2030 uh, with the Inflation Reduction Act. Um, and, you know, also acknowledging that that uh, can't account for everything. And I'm curious, do you think the Inflation Reduction Act is going to do more? Will it have these catalytic effects that will do more and, and to what degree and how and why? Well, Justin, first, thanks for, for hanging out with me again. It's fun. Uh, it actually was more fun in Aspen, but, but it's great here. <laughs> um, uh, uh, I think, let me just start by saying, is there any wonder why Ali Ziedi is going to be the National Climate Advisor? And he is the I have learned so much from him, and I just wish I had half or a quarter of his memory. It's ridiculous. <laughs> um, but it, it, it's great. And I just wanted to start by thanking the whole team. You know, the Climate Policy Office has been an outstanding uh, addition in the White House and one that really reflects the president's, you know, sound commitment to tackling the climate crisis. I've never seen him waver, ever on any decision uh, that he's made on this. And uh, I just couldn't be more proud of the work that this team has been able to do, but also more hopeful about having Ali uh, at the helm. So I just can't thank him enough, um, except he shows me up when he makes me follow him, which is really annoying. <laughs> uh, but having said that, you know, Justin, you're asking the right question, I think, because you know, there's different ways of thinking about how to address the climate crisis. Uh, but I think the president's framing of how he was looking at it was to ensure that it had a catalytic uh, change, uh, that it was the start of, of way, ways in which people could start talking about climate change and looking at climate change through an entirely different lens. You know, I worked for President Obama. He was terrific. But we did not at that point in time have the technologies or have the wherewithal to actually make the kind of change 
that we wanted to. The technologies were simply not available to us. But that's different now. <laughs> you know, so this, the, 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 inf the Inflation Reduction Act and the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law is, is catalytic because we have the kind of technologies and the kind of products and the kind of processes that make people feel better about where they are in their future. We are not standing up on a podium talking about the woe is me on climate. We're just simply saying climate's here. You're looking at the, the numbers, you're looking at the engagements of states now. You know, every state put in a plan for EV uh, uh, charging. Every state, yes, Texas, <laughs> yes, Oklahoma. You know, they didn't argue with it. It's like, damn, I have to be in this because it captured the hopefulness of the future. It, it just was an opportunity framing that refused to leave anybody behind. So when I look at this, this is the most historic and biggest leap forward ever. You know, it's a gigaton of reductions. A gigaton here. And that for those who are ma mathematically challenged, that's a billion, you know, metric tons, which includes me, by the way. I have to memorize that every time I want to speak about it. But but it it's um it's it 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 is um really uh, a, an entirely different framing that talks about real people, real experiences what they're dealing with now. Unfortunately, there are very few deniers anymore because you can't, you know, that's what David's standing up talking about is that's what that portal will show people is the impact that we're gonna face and how we have to address that now if you wanna do it. But to me, the most important thing was, and this is, I think something that, that President Biden and I have in common, we both came from, you know, few means. And we had to make this about human beings. We had to make the investments about how every human being would say, this is a better future for me and a better tomorrow for me. And that's why it's catalytic. That's why you see the private sector stepping up, realizing that they have a president who ain't backing down. They have a president who's figured out how to make a future that can make them money, only they have to do it differently than what they did in the past. And they're jumping on it. So that's what makes me realize is that, you know, when, when I was doing the, the uh, it seems so long ago, but the, the CPP, my little effort to, to move forward on uh, power plants and getting them clean, uh, I realized that we had created a dynamic where I didn't say that things were gonna to change tomorrow. I said, we're gonna get changes over the next three to 10 years. And we set that out as aggressively as we could. And before it even got implemented, the Supreme Court basically put it on a hiatus that ended up being permanent. But what happened during that period of time is within three years, we exceeded what we hoped to do in 10 because it was a signal sender. So what Ali's talking about when he's talking about both, you know, the, the brilliance of Congress moving forward with these bills, coupled with executive action, no one is going to sit around waiting for people to notice that life has changed. We're going to keep pushing. This, is, this White House is not going to sit and say, OK, we got the job done. Climate doesn't work that way. But the, the, the energy that we're seeing from people across the country, the fact that states are engaging, the fact that the private sector is talking in ways that we never anticipated, it's a really fun moment in time. And what we really need to do, and I, I hope I know that Aspen will be focusing on this, is to get every country to, to change to that opportunity frame because this is not a ball game that any one country can win, but one country like the United States can show what leadership means. It can show why this is something that the people will choose. And we have a coalition that we pull together like no other 
that actually made that voice really loud. Well, great. That's a lot of threads to, to pull there. I, I want to just ask you, so you mentioned private sector uh, states, uh, and you also alluded to that, you know, this White House has more to do. And I'm curious to hear, you know, what do you think are the biggest priorities in terms of executive and administrative action, both to ensure that the Inflation Reduction Act is implemented to the best that it can be, uh, but also other things that might uh, bend that emissions curve? Well, Justin, one of the things I, I think we've been hearing loudly from is the environmental justice community. And I and I want to bring that up because it's worth bringing up and it's necessary to sort of hear what they have to say and to think about why, you know, they're raising concerns. And so I, I think one of the things I just want to point out is that one of the, it's sort of crystallizing, I think, in terms of what the Climate Policy Office and the, the broader White House is thinking about. And it is this whole of government approach, but it is really important, um, I think, uh, as a next step, that we make sure that we're marrying these investments with clear standards, <laughs> because that's what worries the environmental justice community. They know between the bipartisan infrastructure law and the Inflation Reduction Act, there's 120 billion. And I keep telling everybody, I have such, I've grown in to being able to stop saying millions and to say billions. It was a hard journey for me. No one's ever offered me a billion dollars. <laughs> you know, at EPA, their entire their entire budget was a little over eight billion. Seriously, what weenies did I have? You know, <laughs> now now we got it. But but the, the whole the whole thing is that is that we we have to do both because they're raising legitimate concerns about ways in which we're going to have to move forward that demands that we focus attention on when we raise up and we we win and we do better. The whole government structure must move up to that as something everybody aspires to and has a standard for. And so I think you're going to see a lot more executive authority uh, being utilized. Now, that's not to, not, not to create uh, big burdens. It's simply to level the playing field and to keep the private sector as well as the public sector and states and communities thinking about using those investments in order to get everybody moving forward and to protect the, the uh, communities that have been disinvested in for so long. You know, Ali's point about, about the ways in which we're structuring the requirements to actually provide incredible inducements for projects in environmental justice communities and investments. And it's, it's just, um, it, it's really, uh, I think not just groundbreaking in terms of the size of the investment, it's how it's being spent. And I think, and I'm really excited that John Podesta is coming into the White House because we got Mitch Landrieu really moving forward in the bipartisan infrastructure law. Now we have John Podesta ready to kick butt, which he always does, mine included at times. <laughs> Uh, to, to actually move forward on, on, the, on the, inf, uh, the Inflation Reduction Act implementation, because it's we have to move quickly. People have to see the change that we promised. You know, President Biden has been promising this change since early on in the campaign. And please don't ever count him out because he's furious. He just will not stop when he promises he delivers. And I think that's what this is all about. Well, I mean, oh, I want to want to ask a bit about, or just to follow up on the bit about executive action outside of the Inflation Reduction Act. First, just to ask, I mean, I think there's a sense among among some that um, you know the administration was waiting for the Inflation Reduction Act or for legislation before really pushing uh, a lot of the key regulations. You know, is that is that true? And and then I guess I'm curious: should we expect you know a, a flurry of things uh, you know coming? coming months um, and you know what might some of these things be that we should be thinking about? Actually, the, I, I don't think it's correct that we were, we were slow in moving forward. I think what's correct is we had a lot of corrections to make. <laughs> don't forget before you can move forward, you gotta undo what was done that was not legally appropriate 
And then you've got to figure out, you know, how you move forward and get things moving. So we've been moving all along, you know, and I don't want to suggest that we're thinking of really new ideas about standards. We're thinking about making sure that we're looking at science and creating standards that are appropriate. So you will see some things coming up. I think Ali highlighted the fact that methane is going to be something we're focused on. So that was, you know, that's a good case and point where you do you do enough to catch up, but then you have to relook. So a lot of what we're doing is just catching up for time lost, which you can do quickly, but then thinking about what are the technologies available to us so that methane can really be detected, those leaks, and corrected. And uh, in, uh, with the inf Inflation Reduction Act and the, bi and the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law, there are real opportunities now to look at how you develop standards that aren't based on how do we keep the cost low, which is how all of our rules have always been done. What's the cheapest way that we can get away with and still make it be okay in the cost effectiveness standpoint? This is all about saving money. <laughs> this is a different scenario. So you can really get very creative about the standards that are being set. But so yeah, I don't think you, what you see coming up is going to be a flurry. But what you see is going coming up is going to be the standard setting process at EPA. It's going to be working with, with DOI on many of those things that David Hayes knows way better than anybody else. Um, you're going to, you know, look at all the tax work that needs to be done now. These are things that, that will take time, uh, but I think the world knows where we're heading and we're going to deliver, deliver that. Well, well, first, I just want to say in 10 minutes, we're going to go to audience questions. So please be thinking about them. I have a feeling this audience won't be shy, but please think of questions. Um, uh, but I want to pick up on the point about uh, environmental justice and, and just to ask, I mean, you made the point, um, very fair point, that it's a lot of money um, between these two pieces of legislation. Uh, and yet there was still, uh, you know, sort of a upcry from, from many in uh, environmental justice uh, who work on environmental justice issues um, over the Inflation Reduction Act. I guess I'm just curious if there's ways in which you um, would think that you might, well, you're leaving, but you might engage, the administration might engage these communities uh, to, uh, you know, help, uh, you know, both shape future yeah. uh, initiatives, but also uh, to, you know, uh, communicate about these things in a way that it doesn't result in, in that kind of uh, um, pain. Yeah, uh, well, I, we, we did engage, I think, pretty effectively with the environmental justice community. Um, and, you know, one of the, one of the great things about working in government, which is why I like it, because I always like challenges, is that when, no matter what you do, it's going to fall short, right? <laughs> there are never like answers. I figured it out. This is it. I'll put it out. Everybody will go, oh, this is great. And it's just a constant push to do more. And rightly so. That's how our government works. And I, I love it. And the environmental justice community was heavily involved in discussions around both of these pieces of legislation and frankly around the, the 200 executive orders that we did and those discussions just have to continue you know i was at a a uh, a meeting yesterday which was really fun i don't I don't always say that when i go to meetings but i was with uh, secretary granholm at the department of energy and we did a round table on decarbonization, uh, industrial decarbonization. And I'm, and I'm looking at the cast of characters sitting around and thinking, you know, we've never agreed on anything. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? I'm like, huh, oh, you're from, uh, I know you, kind of thing. <laughs> Only it, uh, Beverly Wright was there, who is a wonderful environmental justice advocate from Louisiana. And she started her, you know, five minutes of discussion and she said, she said, uh, this is just an amazing place to be. She said, this is the first time that I feel like we have an opportunity to collaborate on a shared value and a shared interest. And she, she said what I'm thinking, which is life has changed, you know, and the, the reason why I'm bringing this up is because 
I think everybody's trying to get their head around an entirely different paradigm than where we used to be. You know, we have shared interests and, and the industry itself, you know, stood up and say, we can do this, we've got to do more of that, we've got to invest in this. You know, we have to get to zero at some point in time. We have to be competitive. You know, they talked about, you know, electric arc furnaces or steel and, and, and talking about what they're doing in cement. You know, these are industries that never had this type of dialogue before. So the world has changed and the environmental justice community is feeling that change, but they're doing exactly what they ought to do. They're making sure that they're not going to be left behind. And so investment isn't enough. You know, I, I think with it, we have great investments in environmental justice communities with block grants and the new accelerator. Things can change there. But as they know better than anybody, that can shift in a moment's time. So they're going to, and rightly so, demand to hold our feet to the fire about what else are we going to do to make sure that the disinvestments don't continue, that not just the investments are there, but a recognition that some of the technologies that we'll be investing in don't definitely re require other traditional conventional pollutants to come with them. That means we have to do standards as well as, as technology investments. So it's, it's really, Quite a remarkable thing. That that round table was like, I was sitting there thinking I, I died and went to a different planet. And I liked it better, actually. It was just so different. Well, I, I, I want to just before we go to audience questions, I give you an opportunity to reflect on your legacy within the administration or something across administrations. I think it's always interesting to hear you talk about how different. Um, you know, working on CPP was back then and versus the work that you're doing now. But I, yeah, just give you an opportunity to reflect and, you know, perhaps if you want to talk a bit about how this landmark Inflation Reduction Act plays into that legacy uh, as well. Well, I, I think that now's a good time for me to, to leave the White House, don't you? I mean, really. <laughs> I, I just know that with every phone call, I'm like, oh, God, something's going to go wrong. <laughs> you, I, honestly, uh, uh, I have been working in this area for like four decades now. I admitted to my husband, who's been telling me that I have to come back home, uh, that, that for the past 17 years, I have basically lived where I worked and visited home. And I figured that's not a winning strategy. Uh, and so uh, once I admitted that, I'm like, oh, God, I got to I got to go home, <laughs> which is what I'm doing. And I look forward to it. But, you know, the 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 I started at the local level in the town of Canton as the first full time health agent. And it was the best experience of my life, the, the, the worst and the best, because it, it so made me realize that that government is all about responding to people and how they see the challenge before them and how you can reframe that challenge and make a difference in it. And it's and it's so I think the reason why President Biden and I get along so well, it which we do, is that it, everything's people, 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 people. Uh, and so I've used that framing always. I speak as clearly as humanly possible. I'm not sure I can speak any differently than that, but it works for me. You know, I don't, I don't run away from mistakes. You know, I don't tell people they shouldn't be worried about something that's worrying them. You know, you, you've got to make government work for people. And, and that's the that's all I've focused on for, for 40 years. Um, and I expect I'll keep yapping about that um, moving forward. But I think that's sometimes what government forgets. And I think that's, that's, the, only, that's the enticement that President Biden uh, uh, sort of made me think about uh, that drove me to the White House. Uh, what's driving me out of the White House is I'm totally exhausted um, and leaving on a high note. 
Because <laughs> it is a, it's an amazing place. It's the smartest people I've ever seen who always have their phones at the ready, who never take a day off. It's so annoying. 